right, let's open up one more time. Let's go to Matthew 17 and Judges chapter 1. Matthew 17 and Judges 1. We'll start off in Matthew and end up in Judges. Like I said last night, I really appreciate you being responsive and attentive to the preaching. I appreciate these other messages these guys have preached as well. And uh, the Lord does something for the preacher too. It's not just the people who listen. So the Lord's really ministered to me as well. And I really appreciate uh, just the privilege of being here. I, I don't take it lightly. It's an honor to be able to uh, be a part of this. Matthew chapter number 17. Verse number one. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Verse 9, just the first part, the Bible says, And as they came down from the mountain. Father, we thank you so much for just what we've had up here this week. Lord, we've had the opposition of the other churches, Lord, but we didn't let that bother us. Lord, we focused on you and we praised you anyway. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for passing by our way. Thank you, God, for ministering to our hearts. Lord, thank you that we have the facts, but you gave us some feeling. Lord, we pray now we might put a little faith in those facts and feeling. And you might help us, Lord, as we close things down. Lord, we know that we're coming down off the mountain, but we don't have to come down from worshiping you. God, I pray that you might help us with the scriptures. Pray that the Bible would have power, the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit would be able to minister to our hearts. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We've had a mountaintop experience. Amen? Amen. You know, it's good to have a mountaintop experience, as you can see from Matthew 17, because when you get on the mountain, you see Jesus Christ differently. I mean, they had been around Jesus for a long time now. They had seen Him do a lot of miracles. They had seen Him heal people, raise people from the dead. But now when they got on the mountain, just Peter, James, and John, they saw Jesus Christ glorified. They had a new appreciation of Jesus Christ. And they heard the voice of God Almighty. You know, you need a mountaintop experience to see Jesus in a little different light. Sometimes you get down in the world and you go through trials and you see Jesus like everybody else is looking at Him. You need to see Jesus Christ like He is in His glory. Come on. And when you do, you fall down on your face like they did. Amen. I wish we could stay up there all the time, but we can't. We can't stay forever. You know, Peter said, you know, Lord, let's make three tabernacles and just stay up here. Yeah. You know, I wish we could. I wish we could just camp out and keep on going. Yeah. But it's not that way. The mountaintop experiences are few and far between in the Christian life. You know, it's not all valleys, it's not all mountains. Most of it is probably along the mountainside when you're trying to get back up on top of that mountain. But not only do you see Jesus differently, when you're up high, you see the world differently. Because you can look down from God's perspective and you see the world, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father. It's no good. You see it for what it is. God gives you a new perspective on top of the mountain. Don't forget it. Don't forget what God shows you on the mountain. Never doubt in the darkness what God showed you in the light. Mark it down. Remember it. You need it. We come down off the mountain, you know, we have 
some leftovers. You ever read the story of the feeding of the 5,000? There's the boy, and I don't know what his name was, but the Bible doesn't tell us. He had his lunch, and he gave his lunch to Jesus, and Jesus took the, the, uh, the five barley loaves and two fishes, and he broke them, and he gave them out to the multitude. What I like about the story is that after it's all done, the Bible says they take up the fragments. And I'm thinking, why in the world do they have, what's these 12 fragments, you know, and you try to figure it out, the Bible numerology, what is 12 and what is this, and dispensationally, and how can we theologically come to a presupposition of technical terms to understand why the Lord would leave leftovers? I think you need leftovers. You know, I think maybe the little boy, maybe the Lord sent the leftovers home with him, and he had 12 barley loaves. I'm just, this is, this is just, this is the DEW version. He had 12 barley loaves, one loaf for each month. So whenever he prayed and he bust that barley loaf, he might have enough to last the whole month. God will give you some leftovers. You can look back to the mountain and say, God fed me up there. God blessed me up there. God gave me something up there. And you can feed off of that when you get down into the valley. God will give you some leftovers. Thank God for it. Give you something to eat later on. Not only are His provisions exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, but there's so much left over. And it's like a well of water springing up inside of you. And it reminds you that He can do it again. You can have another mountaintop experience. If He can do it one time, He can do it again. Amen. Well, we got to go down. Watch out for Brother Gene. He might go off the mountain. <laughs> Brother Robert gets to talking. <laughs> but we got to go down the mountain. You go down a whole lot quicker than you come up. Put the thing in neutral, you just you go down. And you're right back down on the bottom. Back into the world. We can't stay forever. Vance Habner said this about the world. He said, believers are saved out of the world. So they can go into the world to get other people saved out of the world. And that's the only business you have in the world. My dad, he was a great Christian man. Greatest Christian influence in my life. He wasn't a preacher, but he was a Christian. People would ask him, they said, what do you do? He says, I serve Jesus, but I work, but I work over here at the base, Air Force Base. What do you do? I serve Jesus. You got to work, you got to make a living, you got to be out there and rub shoulders a little bit, but you don't have to let them get their dirt on you. You can let Jesus get on them. Now, come over to Judges chapter number one. No doubt when the temptations come, they're going to come when you get down from the mountain. We didn't have time to go there, but in Matthew 17, whenever they come back, we'll see it in just a little bit here. When they come back in Matthew chapter number 17, there's all kind of problems after the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. There's all kind of problems when they come down off the mountain. You have the, the church down there, the other disciples, they can't get a devil cast out. All the people around don't believe because the disciples don't have any power. They don't have any faith. You know, They got their Bible right, but they ain't right. They got all the dispensations figured out, but they can't get a prayer answer. And he comes down, and here's Peter, James, and John. They're coming down off the mountain. Glory to God. You wouldn't believe what God did. And they're sitting there like, Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. I love to tell the story. You really love to, I love to tell the story a bunch of things above. Really? Don't let that discourage you. You come down, not only is the world still just as wicked as it was, but the church is still just as dead as it was. Don't let other Christians discourage you. Don't let them steal your joy. Don't let them take the mountain experience away from you. God did something in your life. God answered some prayers. God met some of your needs. Don't let them take it off of you. Don't let them steal your joy. Peter, James, and John hung around Jesus, they could always have a mountaintop experience. Now look over here in Judges. Just because we're going down from the mountain physically doesn't mean we have to go down spiritually. Amen? Amen. 
Sound good? I'll never say amen with a question mark that I won't think about that. Amen? My message is staying up while going down. Staying up while going down. Judges chapter number one. Here's what happens here. Joshua dies. And so the children of Israel begin to go into the land of Canaan to possess and take over the land. They're getting into their work. They're getting into their walk, trying to claim God's promises going into the land of Canaan. The land of Canaan is not heaven, although some of the hymns you know, sing it that way and deal with it. The land of Canaan has to do with the glorious Christian life. It has to do with serving God with the truth that God's done for you after He brought you out of Egypt, after He washed you in the blood, after He brought you through all of that. So they begin to go in after the death of Joshua, and they're going in, and things at first seem to go pretty good, and they begin to win some battles, verse number 5, against uh, Adonai Bezek, and they fought against the Canaanites, and things go pretty good for a little while, but then things begin to go down. Look down, if you will, in verse number 18. The Bible says also Judah took Gaza with the coast thereof and Ashkelon with the coast thereof and Ekron with the coast thereof. And the Lord was with Judah and he drave out the inhabitants of the mountain. Praise God. They had revival on the mountain. You see it? But could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley. It's easy to praise up here. It's easy to pray up here. It's easy to witness and talk about Christ up here and shout up here and read your Bible up here. But when you get down in the valley, that's when the temptation comes. They couldn't drive out the inhabitants of the valley. You'll notice this thing as you keep reading, verse number 19, you see that. Come down, if you will, to verse number 21. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabit Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Come down to 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshean and her towns, nor Taanach and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibleam and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Same thing in 29. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Look in verse 30, 31. Neither did Zebulun, neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants. All the way through here. It gets so bad, look in verse number 32. But the Asherites dwell among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drill them out. They're dwelling with the Canaanites instead of the Canaanites dwelling with them. The thing gets flipped around. Hey, this is our Father's world. This isn't, there's no Mother Earth, there's Father God. This thing belongs to the Lord. So, well, you know, this is this, all this. Hey, we, are, we belong to God. We have some land to conquer in our own lives. God gave us some promises on the mountain. We need to take them down to the valley. The problem is when they go down, what they do is they settle for second best. They just drive out some of the inhabitants. They just got a little bit of victory. Do I need to remind you that partial victory is complete defeat? If you haven't yet let go, if you haven't yet surrendered, if you haven't yet laid it on the altar, whatever it is, you got one more chance. Complete surrender. We need to be in this thing all, all the way. They settled for second best. How do you stay up while you go down? Look in verse number 19. Don't concede too early. Don't concede too early. And it's still early on in the battle in verse number 19. They do good on the mountain. They couldn't drive them out in the valley. You say, what happened? I believe they saw the chariots of iron. They saw the chariots instead of Christ. They saw the giants instead of God. It reminds me of Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 13 when they get ready to come into the land the first time. And Moses is on board, and Joshua and Caleb are the only two spies that are on board. They're ready to go. But the other spies, they see the giants. They see all the, uh, the walls. They see the cities. They see all that, and they're intimidated. Young people, don't be intimidated by the world. Don't be intimidated by the glamour, by the glitter. Don't be intimidated by the, the fame and the fortune and the prestige and the money. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. Don't be intimidated by those things. I believe the spies went in and they were intimidated and they saw that the 
Opposition for them was too strong. The giants. No way I could beat that. You know, all of us have giants in their life. Right? Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. You have one particular sin that's bigger than others, and it beats you up all the time. You know, you have a giant bigger than that sin. Jesus Christ on the inside. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Don't let the opposition. Opposition is not strong. Man, God's way stronger than that sin. You know, before sin ever was, God was. Before hell ever was, God was. Before Satan ever was, God was. Amen. 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 Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. Opposition, they say, is too strong. The obstacles are too great. Look at them big walls, man. We've got to go climb over those walls. How in the world am I going to scale that wall? There's no way. There's just too many things in the way. I've got too much life going on. I got to go to school and I got to work and I got to do my chores and I got to go to church and I've got to do this and I got, I got too many things in the way. It's getting in the way of Jesus. Too many obstacles. Why don't you do like the old preacher used to say, make a stepping stone out of a stumbling block. You see a stumbling block, just step on it. Just step on it and keep going. Keep going straight. Set your face like a flint like Christ did and make a stepping stone out of a stumbling block. Then they said the outlook was too narrow. All they could see was the giant. All they could see was there's no way we can do this. All they could see is everybody else is doing it wrong. Everybody else is against us. There's not many Bible believers left. There's not many people that like the old time religion. There's, you know, those hymns, they're just so outdated. We need a screen and we need all that. One thing you young people saw this week is you don't need a screen. You don't need contemporary music. You don't need a new Bible version. You don't need a praise team. All you need is what you've got, that hymn book and that Bible. Amen. Well, they see their outlook is too narrow. All they can see is right in front of them. They can't see what you can see on top of the mountain. You see, if you're on top of the mountain, you see God's a whole lot bigger than those giants. That's like David. He goes down in the valley of Elah. And he goes down in that valley and all these people are giving up. And David says, you going to let this guy talk this way? How is it these people can say all these words around you, young people, and they're sitting there cussing Jesus and it don't bother you? I ain't saying you got to be rude, but sometimes you just got to stand up and say, hey, watch your mouth. You know, the, God's last name is not damn, right? That's right. Hey. It's not His last name. Right. Jesus, oh, you're having a prayer? Let's pray. Oh, come on. Oh, my God. OMG, OMG. You know, that's taking God's name in vain. Using the name of God without prayer and without reverence is taking God's name in vain. We just listen to it. God says, no. You don't need to concede too early. You, you, you start losing before you go down. You're already thinking about how you can compromise a little bit, how you can concede a little bit. Don't concede too early. And then number two, look down in verses 22 through 26. Don't compromise too quickly. Verse number uh, 21. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them, and the house of Joseph sent to descry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz, and the spy saw a man come forth out of the city and said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof, unto this day. Compromise. It starts out, I guess... I don't, I'm not really putting my points, but I'll put this. You start out and you condemn sin. On top of the mountain, you're like, yeah, that stuff's wrong. I can see it clearly. I can see the world down there, the world, the flesh, all that stuff. That's bad. I see from God's perspective, I condemn it. And then it begins to, to move a little bit, and you begin to compromise with it. 
well, we'll just use this guy here, and then we'll let him go. Okay. You know, I'll just let the old man get away with a little bit. I'll give him a little food, because I know he hadn't eaten all week. We've been up here on the mountain feeding the new man, and the old man hadn't anything to eat. You know, old man is like Ishmael. He's standing there on the side of the road. He's down there where we left him. You know, Ishmael, you kick him out and you don't show him any mercy. Ishmael's the old man, Galatians chapter number 4. The old man's got to go before Isaac can ever be sacrificed. And so there's Ishmael. We left him at the bottom of the mountain and he's holding his little cardboard sign. Feed me. God bless you. And if you're not careful when you come down, you say, well, he hadn't had nothing to eat all week. And I, I feel sorry for Ishmael. I'm going to give him just a little bite. No, you need to starve him out. You've been feeding the new man. Keep starving out the old man. Don't compromise and let him go. Don't compromise and let him go. Why? This guy goes up and he builds the city and the city is named unto this day. You read about it later on in the Bible. Don't compromise too quickly. What about Samson in the Valley of Sorek? All kind of valleys in the Bible. Samson in the Valley of Sorek. You know what happened? He met a woman named Delilah. Samson's problem early on is seen, and he had a problem with the lust of the flesh. And what the devil is, he used appetite to ruin Samson. And he destroyed all his life because early on he saw a weakness in his armor. And Satan is looking for a weakness in your armor. And he came after Samson. What did he wind up doing? Well, he began to... At first it was just you know all about the flesh, and he'd have a girlfriend here and a girlfriend there. But when he got down into the valley... He fell in love. You heard about the boy, I might have told you this, the boy who he was really in love with his girlfriend there and he wanted, and she was old fashioned like, and she said, Look, if we're going to take this thing any further, you've got to come home and meet my dad. And we're going to have dinner and we'll have you over to meet my dad. And the boy said, Okay, that's good, I'll do that. So he went to the pharmacy. Back then, the pharmacy, they would sell chocolates and candies and things. So, you know, if you're going to go see your girlfriend, you want to take her some chocolates. Amen. Amen? Sound good? Amen. We got these married guys in here. Yeah, you want to take some chocolates. So. He goes to the pharmacy and he's picking out some chocolates and he, he gets one little one and he gets a bigger one and then he gets a real big one. He's up there about to pay and the pharmacist says, Son, what you doing here? He goes, Well, I'm taking these to my girlfriend. going to go meet her. And I'm supposed to have supper with her and her old man and, and i got to meet him. You know, that's just how it is. He goes, Why you got three? He goes, Well, I figure if she invites me to go sit out on the swing with her on the porch, I give her this small box of chocolates. Then if uh, she moves over a little close to me there, I might give her this big box of chocolates. Then if she reaches over and kisses me on the jaw, I'll give her this even bigger box of chocolates. And he says, that sounds like a pretty good plan. So he wraps them up for him, sends him home, and uh, of course the night comes and he goes out and he, he goes to the girlfriend's house and he meets the family and she brings them in and they sit down at the nice table and all the family's there and, and the, the father of the girlfriend says, look son, since you're our visiting guest, why don't you pray before we eat? So he begins to pray. And he starts in, oh, Lord God, we're thankful for this food and this provision that you give us. Give us. We thank you for these good trees that are out here. This amazing lunch. And your mercy and your grace. And God, we also thank you for the missionaries on the field. And he starts naming all the missionaries. And God, we're thankful for all the soul winners out there. And we're thankful that we spend 30 minutes a day praying. And we're thankful, God, you gave us time to read our Bibles a couple hours this morning before we came. And God, we're thankful that we love you with all our heart, soul, and mind. And he goes on for about 30 minutes in prayer. He says, in Jesus' name, amen. They all get up, and his girlfriend looks over and says, wow, I didn't know you were so spiritual. He goes, yeah, I didn't know your daddy was the pharmacist either. See, that was Samson's problem, kind of like uh, Solomon's problem. Solomon, he had all these wives, and at first it was okay because he was making political expediency moves. In other words, he was marrying them to kind of get in politics and get in good with the kingdom. And he did have peace for 40 years. Amen. And he had that going on for a while, and the Bible says through the years that his wives turned away his heart. What he did, he started giving little pieces of his heart away. 
Whenever he would allow them to worship the false gods, he compromised. You can worship Malcolm. I know you don't understand about the true God, so you can set up your temple here. And Yeah, I want to keep you happy too, so you can have your temple and you can do this. And he began to give away pieces of his heart. That's why it's so dangerous when you compromise. You sell your heart, just like Samson. He lost his strength, he lost his senses, he lost his sight, and he lost his sovereignty. So yeah, look at the very end. Yeah, but he dies. You know what the epitaph of Samson could have been? The epitaph of Samson, it could have read like this. It didn't have to end this way. He could have been the greatest judge Israel ever had. But it was all about his flesh. It was all about self. Compromise. You begin to condemn it. You begin to compromise with it. You begin to condone it. You begin to condone it. Don't cower too soon. Come down to verse number 34. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down. They're chasing them off like little schoolgirls. Chasing them off. They begin to condone things. They begin to compromise. And as you get into chapter number 2, the angel of God comes down, and verse number 1... I made you go up out of Egypt and brought you into the land which I swear to your fathers. I said I will never break my covenant with you. Verse 2. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? You see, what they had done is they condoned, they compromised. I want to say they connected. They connected. And then they consented. See, when you yield to Satan's temptations, it starts off up here. You're real strong on the mountain. No, 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 no. And then as you come down, you get all the way down to this place. And don't forget what you've learned on the mountain. Now, I want to close it out by going back to our, one of our main passages in Luke chapter 4. Don't forget our very first verse. There is no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able to will with the temptation all that make the way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Well, let's look in Luke chapter 4. Thank God Jesus Christ did defeat the devil. I like to be on the winning team. You know, we're talking about sports and talking about some of these football people and how they get all involved in it and, and, uh, and they get all involved in sports. And somebody said, why do you think people get so crazy about it? I mean, they spend boo of money on it and they, they dress themselves up like it. They just pour themselves into this stuff. And it, why? It's almost like they have to have something bigger than themselves to give themselves value. You know, we have something bigger than ourselves. We have someone bigger than ourselves. The Lord Jesus Christ. He won the battle. He defeated the devil. He is the victor. So in Luke chapter number 4, as we close this out and we look at these three temptations, we mentioned repent and replace. Notice verse number 4. When Satan tempts him with the lust of the flesh, with appetite, Turn these stones to bread. You know, just do it yourself. Just please yourself. Look what Jesus says in verse 4. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. If you want to stay up while going down, you've got to be in the word of God. You don't have to give in to the desires of the flesh. I'll just put it over here. The word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word. If Jesus Christ used the word of God, we've got to use the word of God. If Jesus Christ, he could have said anything because anything he said would have been scripture because he's the word of God and in the flesh and anything he said was God's word. But what did he do? He quoted the Old Testament. So why don't we got to memorize all these verses? Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You need the Bible to be in you. It's a good thing to read the Bible, but you need the Bible to read you. That Bible's alive, and the more of it you can put in you, the more of it's going to help you, and it's going to quicken the Holy Spirit inside of you and prick your conscience. 
And it'll help you to realize I don't have to do what this flesh tells me because the Word of God says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed into sin. You are alive. No, you're dead. You are alive. No, you're dead. You're crucified with Christ. I buried you. Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. My sins are buried. The old man is on the cross. The old man is crucified. I don't have to give in to the appetites of the flesh. I don't have to do what this flesh tells me to do. I can say yes to God. I can say no to the flesh. I can say yes to the Holy Spirit. I can say no to this flesh. I can say yes to the Bible. I can say no to the appetites of the flesh. I have the Bible, the Word of God. That's my sword. Thank God for the shield of faith. But you've got to pull the sword out and stick him. When the devil tempts you, when you start thinking sin, think Scripture. When you think sin, think Scripture. The second temptation, he takes him on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in, in a moment of time. In other words, Jesus... I can give you a different kind of mountaintop experience. The world says we have mountain retreats. We can come up on a mountain and we can get you closer in touch with yourself. And you can have all kind of ambitions and see all kind of things that you can do on the mountain of pleasure. He shows him all these kingdoms in a moment of time. Verse 6, all this power will I give you glory of them for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will I give it if thou therefore wilt worship me all shall be thine and Jesus answered and said unto him get thee behind me Satan for it is written thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve worship remember how we closed out the message on this one what Satan's trying to get him to do in order for him to get this ambitious goal of all the kingdoms, he's got to bow to Satan. Satan will use your own drive, your own ambition, the things that your eyes have fallen prey to to get you off track and you don't even know that you're following the devil. You don't even know that you're worshiping Satan. You better be worshiping God. We don't have time to preach all on worship, but worship always involves obedience Obedience always involves sacrifice, and sacrifice always costs you something. If you're not obeying Christ, if you're not sacrificing for Christ, if you're not paying a price, you're not worshiping. Oh, it's easy to worship in the flesh. Jam out and have a good time and get all emotional. No sacrifice in that. But when you sit on your rear end and listen to preaching for an hour, and you've got to concentrate and you pay attention. You take time out of your schedule, shut everything off, read the Bible, take time, pay the price, put the money in the offering plate, try to help out ministries with your tithe, sacrifice hours, sacrifice time, sacrifice praise, the lip of praise, giving thanks to His name, worship. Then you realize, you know what, all this stuff that I see, it's not really the real thing. I need to see the invisible like Moses. Amen. I see by faith. And by faith, I know Jesus is pleased with my sacrifice. The world says, oh, you're stupid for doing that. You're stupid for sacrificing that. Just like they did when Mary broke the alabaster box of ointment. This could have been sold and given to the poor. But you know what? When he went to the cross, those soldiers began to beat him. and They put the crown of thorns on his head. I believe that fragrance, that perfume that Mary had anointed him with was still coming off of him. And they could smell the fragrance of the worship and the fragrance of the sacrifice of her breaking her alabaster box of ointment. And not only did no man ever speak like this man, no man ever smelled like this man when the blood and the sweat and the tears were being offered for us because of Mary's sacrifice. Worship. Well, look at the last one. The devil doesn't give up because I believe he aims at this one because the root is pride. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of a temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest 
At any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, of course the Bible again, Thou shalt not the Lord thy God. I'm pointed out in verse number 10 there when you run the cross reference to Psalm 91. He left out in all thy ways. Okay, so with the pride of life, he's trying to get him to do what he wants to do. And he says, not only do I not have to give in to the desires of the flesh, I don't have to take what the world has to offer. And he says, I don't have to have my reward now. I don't have to jump off the temple now. I'm going to get all the kingdoms one day. I don't have to jump off the temple now and let everybody see who I am. Because he says, if thou be the Son of God, who are you really? You know, why don't you prove that you are somebody by changing your gender? Why don't you prove you are somebody by dressing like a girl and wearing skinny jeans? Why don't you prove you are... I'm going to keep on hitting that until I go home, I guess. Why don't you prove you are somebody by acting like a boy? Why don't you prove you are somebody by doing this like the world and doing this like the world? No. You know what? My worth and my value is found in God and who He made me in Christ. I am somebody in Jesus Christ. I am nobody outside of Christ. The Bible says you are complete in Him. Well, I wish I was this, and I wish I was that, and I wish I was that, and, and the pride and the ambition trying to drive at, I will exalt my throne. I want to be somebody. God didn't make me this way. I'm really this kind of person. No, you need to realize you're complete in Christ. You've got your own fingerprints. You've got your own personality. God made us all as individuals, and He loves each and every one of us just like He made us. Thank God, even though we have faults, even though we mess up, we can confess up, and He still loves us, and He forgives us, and He says, you can go in all thy ways. If you'll follow in His ways, I don't have to have my reward now. Full surrender. God, I want to do what you've called me to do the way you want me to do it. Not the way so-and-so's doing it. I want to pattern myself like last year's messages after the Lord Jesus Christ. One day we are going to be completely conformed to His image. You know what? There's nothing wrong with starting to get a head start on that. We were doing rapture practice earlier, remember? Just trying to get a little light on my foot. So when it happens, I can go up quick. So I can go ahead and fall in love with heaven. I can go ahead and get excited about going there. And I can go ahead and say, you know what? I'm going to be righteous and holy and pure. Think about the no mores of Revelation. You ever study those? There's no more sickness. There's no more sepulchers. There's no more sorrow. There's no more separation. There's no more Satan. There's no more sin. No more sin. One day I'm going to be able to think anything I want to think, say anything I want to say, do anything I want to do, go anywhere I want to go, and it'll be perfect and pure. So why don't we go ahead and get a head start on that? Let's go ahead and live righteous. Let's go ahead and live according to His way. Let's do things in His timing. Let's put Jesus first. Let's put God's will first in our life. Repent from, but we've got to replace it with these. I believe even though we're coming down off the mountain, even though we're going down, we can stay up on the inside. If we'll do this. Amen. Let's pray.